this summer with temperatures over 100 degrees and with our hot and dry climate, please be reminded to keep cool, stay hydrated, and keep your pets safe too. The spread of wildland fires poses a great risk to our community, especially during this time of year. For preparedness tips and more information, visit slc.gov slash fire. And on the COVID-19 front, masks are working. Keep at it, Salt Lake City. On this week's episode of Capital City News, we hear from Jorge Chamorro, the city's compliance director, about evolving parking enforcement during COVID-19. And our History Minute this week, just in time for National Women's Suffrage Month, is about Seraph Young, the first woman in Utah and in the nation to vote. Let's get started with our look back. Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall issued an executive order directing Police Chief Mike Brown to adopt and implement a series of reforms to the Salt Lake City Police Department's policies. By no later than September 5th, Chief Brown will enact seven reforms to his department's use of force, body-worn camera, and search and seizure policies. Every community deserves law enforcement that serves and protects all of our families. I believe that. Chief Brown believes that. To that end, we are committed to making meaningful institutional changes to the way that our city is policed, reforms that build trust and operate on transparency. The people of this community deserve a city that is equitable for all who reside here. Today we're taking another step in our commitment to making the Salt Lake City Police Department the most well-trained and progressive police department in the country. The policy changes are part of a longer plan for police reform in the city and will include the work of the Salt Lake City Commission on Racial Equity in Policing. Black Lives Matter are the bold words brightly painted on the east side of the historic Salt Lake City and County Building. Eight local artists were chosen to design the mural that reflects the community and the city's commitment to real change and serves as a visual representation of the collaborative work towards racial equity and justice ahead. Artists will be on hand to talk about their unique designs during a live virtual event on August 13th at noon at facebook.com slash SLC government. Rose Park residents looking for Wi-Fi or computer access can now get connected through Salt Lake City's new pilot program, Rose Park Connect. The program will run until the end of August, providing digital access to those in need of information or seeking essential services such as applying for jobs, finding a COVID-19 testing site, doing homework, and more. Staff from the Census Bureau will be on site to help residents fill out their 2020 census, now due by September 30th. Social distancing and wearing masks is required. The city hopes to expand the program to other parts of the city with the help of the community. To learn more, visit slc.gov slash mayor slash COVID-19. There's a new benefit of up to $308 coming to families of children on free or reduced school lunch. The Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, EBT, is a federal program intended to make up the cost of free or reduced school meals that families would have received while their children were in school from March through May this year. Students who receive free or reduced lunch on or before March 16th will need to apply by August 31st. For those who receive SNAP benefits, no action is required. To learn more and to apply, visit pebtutah.org. As local businesses are opening their doors to more patrons, the need for convenient short-term parking has increased since the beginning of the pandemic. Jorge Chamorro, the city's compliance director, shares details about how parking has evolved during COVID-19 and what to expect. My name is Jorge Chamorro. I am the director of uh, the compliance division. Um, 
part of uh, public services in the city. Part of compliance naturally is parking enforcement uh, across the city. And we, we've got some changes coming up uh, right now. Could you talk to us about those and why they were made in the first place and why we're switching them back? Sure. So back at the, um, at the beginning of the emergency declaration, when uh, the city was facing a rapid escalation of uh, COVID cases, we realized that one of the, the um, recommendations was to remain at home. So that would be the, safe, uh, the safest place to be um, during those um, uncertain times. And part of that uh, will require people to leave their vehicles uh, on the street. So normally you will have people commuting every day in the morning and you wouldn't see their, their, their cars. They are not in need of, of long-term parking on the street. But um, in order to, to accommodate this, this demand, uh, the, the city decided to suspend several ordinances that will allow those, those people to uh, not worry by leaving their cars on the street uh, and, and earning a, a citation. So yeah, that was, uh, that was the original intent of this um, suspension. And yeah, uh, as you mentioned, the, uh, some of these ordinances will be uh, reinstated um, soon, uh, as of August 12th, uh, meter enforcement, uh, meaning for those who park on meter spaces in downtown, they, um, they will be required to pay the fee, uh, otherwise they, they will um, be cited. Why are those spaces in particular important for helping bring back our economy? You know, some people might say um, that this is sort of a, a really um, a reckless move when we want people to stay home and charging people for parking might be a problem. Why are these spaces important to change this ordinance for? It is very important to mention and to uh, highlight the fact that the meters are only located in very specific areas of downtown as an amenity to those uh, businesses located in those areas. So this is not um, all over the city. This is just uh, very specific areas. So this is an amenity that the city manages. Uh, so it, it will help and it helps um, bringing uh, customers in in a more convenient way. When you are able to park closer to, to a business, uh, you get an incentive, right? Um, so this, this uh, particular spaces were never meant to be long term. So now that we see more activity in downtown, it is important for us to, to get back to the, the management of, of these areas. So yes, it will be um, just the meter uh, spaces. Now, if you live in downtown, I understand that um, you may seem out of options, but I can, I can assure you that there are many options around the city that are not metered and some of those ordinances continue to be suspended, which means you will not be getting a citation if you leave your vehicle um, uh, long-term on the street, as long as it, it is otherwise legally parked. So this is only affecting, at this point, just spaces that are metered. When, is there any expectation of when we see that might, might change, or is this sort of the way things are gonna be for a while? I know this is very cliche, but the situation is changing by the day. And if we continue to see uh, uh, good signs, uh, I am I'm sure that the city will start looking at, at accommodating um, some, some requests and, and bringing back some of those ordinances. Uh, as of now, we don't have a date. Uh, we are hopeful that, you know, besides parking, that the whole situation and the community is feeling uh, safer. So they, they continue to um, um, get back into a, a more normal uh, lifestyle. And that will bring back uh, the demand for, for parking enforcement to, to come back and, and continue to manage the curbside in the city. For people who want to track and make sure what, where they should be parking and what's not going to get them in trouble, where do they go? Who do they contact for that sort of information as far as parking is concerned? So we have our main line, uh, and I can give you the phone number for that. Um, where everything related to the ordinances, we can provide information about it. Uh, the proclamations get released um, and, and they are put out on, on different platforms, social media, um, different media outlets. 
um, but if, if you want a reference of everything COVID related, accommodations, restrictions, suspensions, uh, the mayor's office has a, a very specific uh, website. And, and if you go to the city's website, slcgov.com, you will, you will see the banner that says everything COVID related, click here, and you will get uh, all the, the, the most up-to-date information related to COVID. And now we go back in time for our History Minute. In response to a robust call for suffrage by the women of the Utah Territory, the Utah Territorial Legislature began debate on January 27, 1870, on an act that would give women the right to vote. For almost two weeks, they argued, but on February 10, 1870, both chambers of the legislature unanimously passed the act. The only thing standing in the way of suffrage was a signature from the acting governor of the territory, Stephen A. Mann. On February 12th, just two days after the act's passage, Mann signed the act into law despite expressing grave reservations, immediately giving women the ability to vote. Just two days after that, a municipal election was held in Salt Lake City at City Hall. Seraph Young, a schoolteacher and grandniece of Brigham Young, arrived to cast a ballot along with 25 other women and made history as the first woman in the country to vote in an election. The newspapers were there to cover it, and the moment is immortalized in a mural at the state capitol building. Seraph Young was born in Nebraska in 1846 and was brought to Utah as an infant with the pioneers. She was a school teacher when she cast that ballot and ended up moving to New York to live with her Civil War veteran husband. She passed away in 1938 and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Thanks for watching this episode of Capital City News. We hope you tune in next time to stay up to date on all the latest. For SLC TV, I'm Poonam Kumar.